Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Mind Rise podcast. I'm your host, Bailey Furman, psychotherapist, coach, and author of Own Your Power, as well as the founder at Mind Rise. Today, you're in for a treat. We are going to be joined by special guest, business Reiki master, and author, Sensei Victoria Whitfield. Today's topic is all about quieting the mind, connecting to ourselves, and finding space for meditation as leaders. Sensei Victoria Whitfield helps empathic entrepreneurs and leaders to stay grounded and clear as they navigate the emotional roller coaster of business development by using the power of strategic meditation. Sensei Victoria is a published author, a successful six figure energy healer, and has toured the world showing heart centered and growth minded leaders how to get connected to their natural intuition and truly be hashtag visionary so that they can work less and increase their impact even more. You can learn more at naturalintuition.com. Sensei Victoria is the first business Reiki master and the hostess of the five-star rated Journeypreneur podcast on iTunes. And again, you guys are in for a treat today. I have known Sensei Victoria for years and she's absolute magic and she just makes that whole meditation thing make sense for how it helps us to become better leaders. So I invite you to dive in and join me in this conversation with Sensei Victoria Whitfield as we quiet the mind and find our capacity for growth as leaders through meditation. Okay, so it's funny to be talking to you, my friend, on uh, on the podcast today because in many ways, like we could just talk about anything all day long. <laughs> True. <laughs> right, right, right. Because we do. We know each other so well, and I want to at least give us some credit here. We got range. We got range. Mm -hmm. It's a, we can go from meditation all the way into the life of a leader and an entrepreneur. And I think what's really sexy, juicy, and delicious of today's conversation, I know, is that we are going to be blending the two and talking about meditation for leaders. Mm -hmm. So, but you didn't wake up fabulous, right? You didn't wake up all like, oh yeah, oh, got it. <laughs> so what is the path to becoming Sensei Victoria? Like, you know, many times like people see who we are on our social media and we're like, oh, she must have been born like with you, like levitating or floating or with fairy dust in the air. <laughs> but like, give us the real deal. What was the path to becoming you? Oh my goddess. Yeah. So the path to becoming me, I would have to say, I mean, literally how I was born, I was nearly killed um, on the on the way out. My I was taking on too much blood from my mom and they're like, oh, we should probably abort the baby now. And she's like, uh, I'm giving birth. How about not? <laughs> yeah. So like I'm, for all intents and purposes, technically I'm not supposed to be here. And now that I am, well, might as well cause some trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Uh, but as far as like, I, I originally, I didn't want to be a Reiki master, you know, like in kindergarten. They're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Everyone raising their hands. And for me, little miss people, please her. I said, I want to be a teacher so that my teacher could be like, yay. <laughs> now, weirdly enough, I actually am a teacher. That is what sensei means in Japanese. Uh, it means teacher. Um, but how I got onto this whole meditation Reiki path is I personally am a high impact, high achiever. Like I am wired to get things done. Any position I've ever held has always, when I was working for other people, always ended up being the key holder, the second in command to whoever's the founder, right? Uh, executive assistant or um, assisting the founder, always the, the second to the person who's the owner. Um, and it's because of that inner drive um, and learn as I go, I pick up things really quickly that uh, I derived a lot of significance from that hard work and that drive and that excellence. And so, okay, that's great. But the, what shifted things for me was working myself into the hospital right? Because, okay, I'm the one that holds everything down, right? I could, you know, ask for help, but no, like I'm the one that everyone's leaning on in the company and how I worked myself into the hospital in particular is when I was working my last position at a nonprofit, absolutely amazing nonprofit, very passionate about it to this day. 
Um, and my goodness, I, it was a hot summer day here in New Jersey. You know how it gets like super humid. And I had a window of opportunity to, you know, turn two feet to the side and turn the air conditioner on. Didn't take that opportunity. Had a window of opportunity to call up um, the maintenance guy to help open the windows because I like wanted some fresh air and so didn't take that opportunity. I even had a op window of opportunity to wait the five minutes for someone to come back in the office. I was so good at what I was doing, they would leave me by myself. And usually things were fine. And I've opened this window, physical window in this beautiful Victorian building before, uh, like a historic uh, building they dedicated to the nonprofit. But unfortunately, this time, um, the window of opportunity that I didn't take now is coming for me. Wham! It, like, falls on my fingers. Crushing my, like, I'm trapped literally down to the bone by my knuckles uh, in between two 30 to 40 pound panes of glass. And I suck with irony. I hate irony. So I'm like window of opportunity. No. And so there are a lot of like nerve endings in the hands and so much that the blood went away from my throat. I couldn't scream or ask for help. At that point I was trapped. So for the next seven minutes, I was stuck in my window of opportunity that I worked myself into, right? Not asking for help, not valuing my health. And that was the day that turned everything around because, all right, finally someone came and found me, the, actually the founder, and he was wrestling me out. Um, and there was this point, they call it having like a gamma uh, brainwave moment where you do something that you really shouldn't do, but because like you're, you're really tapping into your potential, you can. Like that's like when moms can lift cars off of babies and stuff. And as I was in that, um, stuck in the window, my window of opportunity, down to the knuckles, like literally, if you're watching, this is my normal knuckle. This, I'm pushing it down as hard as I can. One's at a 90 degree, one's at a 45 degree angle. I will never forget this day. Um, and I had this moment of clarity where I'm like, huh, you know, if I never get out of this window, I'll never get to see my nephew again, one person I love most on earth. And then it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this. I ripped my hands out of the window, looked at the bone, fainted, split my glasses on the way down. Now I'm blind um, as well as unable to provide for myself. And it forced me to receive help, right? The founder there, he um, is amazing. And I've been teaching meditation for years and years. He said, put your feet on the ground take a deep breath in. When I finally came to, I was starting to go into shock. He's like, remember all of the stuff that I taught you about meditation. And then all day long, I didn't, I couldn't speak, but somehow people got the message um, that I needed help. And people were literally running up, sending in calls, messages, uh, texts everyone asking how much money does she need? She had better not have to pay for anything. You know, the worst thing that I feared at the time, you know, I, I joined that position for love, not for money. So I was the most afraid of going into the hospital without insurance. It was there it was happening. But in that very same moment, and this is where we're going to tie it into meditation and leadership, in that very same moment of my absolute fear, I was met with absolute support and it was amazing because for me, that opened up my ability to believe in and trust that the universe can provide. Um, and the more that I'm able to listen and ask for help, the more I'm able to get done rather than working myself into the hospital. So the reason why I show uh, leaders how to meditate um, and really help them learn about grounding is so that they don't miss their windows of opportunity to really have, um, to receive all of the support and resources that are around them every day and in every way. You don't have to work yourself into the hospital to slow down. You don't have to um, work yourself into complete breakdown and burnout in order to find out who's really with you. Some people think like you got to get all the way down to rock bottom in order to know who's with you. Actually, you don't. You just have to open your eyes and open your mouth, open your heart and show up and ask. And so bringing in more meditation, um, self-care, mindset and awareness 
helps to ground high achievers, right? People who are prone to excellence and executing execution a lot helps to ground us so that we can really receive all of the resources and abundance that are really around us. Mm -hmm. Right. And Victoria, but you put it so beautifully in the sense that like, whether it's your, your hands getting stuck or you get sick or you slipped down the flight of stairs, like sometimes we're this freight train that has left the station and until there's an act of like an act of, of God, God as like of life, right? We many times, or even like the come to Jesus from our partner of just like, Hey, like, I haven't seen you. You're working too much. Or your kids who say like, yeah, I'm not even going to invite you to the baseball game because, well, you never come anyway. Like whatever we have that almost like outside intervention, a lot of times we don't see it because we're so deep in it that we don't see how hard that we're working to the detriment of ourselves and to the exclusion of all the other parts of our life. And we do need a wake up, a wake up from that. And you're right that it's, we don't have to hit a rock bottom but opening our eyes to the resources that are around us. Um, and I think that that, you know, what do you think holds people back from being able to see that before the, you know, the, the slam, the crash, the, the WTF? Like, why do we get so wrapped up into our own blender of life that we're not, like, getting off that hamster wheel? Like, why do we just stay in this uncomfortable, comfortable, familiar place? Yeah. So that's a really powerful question. That question on its own is a journey, <laughs> right? Because everyone's, um, uh, everyone's reason I think is different, but I can tell you like over the last 10 years of working with leaders and entrepreneurs, what I've seen as like some common denominators and common themes as well as in, in myself uh, as, and I come from a family of entrepreneurs. So there's this thing of the money or the outcome is more important than me and my health. Like the, the getting the thing done or moving the project forward is what's the focus or where, where it's at, right? Where's, um, where we place our attention, our priority, our interest is that the money is more important than me. The, the solving the problem is more important than me. My health, we then, uh, and I'm putting it on me, my health becomes, um, something that I take for granted. Or I just expect it to always be there, right? It's not, um, it's not on the to-do list. It doesn't have anything to do with that. In fact, it, to consider my personal health and well-being, my mental health, my spiritual health and mindset, well-being and proper functioning while on the clock, while on the clock is inappropriate. It's, it's inappropriate. This is something that is meant to be done on my own time, um, or if I'm investing in it, it has to come from discretionary income. It shouldn't have anything to do with something that's professional. Like we've taken our, our physical bodies. I've seen it in me and, and many of my clients where we'll take our bodies out of the professional environment. We're just assuming that you're part of this machine or you're part of the business, you're your health, your wellness, your, your mental health, your mindset has nothing to do with being productive or taking action. And the way that I um, tend to approach this kind of um, disembodied, quite literally disembodied approach to uh, productivity um, and moving things forward is by asking this question, what do you think is responsible for the massive action that you want to see happen? What do you think makes that come to be? What do you think is the force behind bringing in the clients or um, the force behind uh, running the business, behind um, communicating to your team XYZ or the website or whatever? What, what's going to actually make, where does that come from? 
Does that just come out of thin air? And I ask it with, as like a loaded question because the force behind that is ourselves, right? Your energy is the force behind your action. In fact, it's, that's the definition of energy is the capacity to do work. But we forget where's the energy coming from. It's coming from our bodies, coming from our minds. Your brain is a very complex organ. Um, and you can't just shove thoughts in and expect solutions to come out or just shove tasks in and expect execution to come out in this linear approach um, to the body and being. So I would have to say that what really stops us um, really stops leaders especially is forgetting to include more of a holistic mindset. And I like to think of it as being disembodied or it's just taking the human body out of business. It has no place in business. It's just, it has nothing to do with it. Right, right, right. It's so interesting, you know, as I'm hearing you talk, the thing that kept dropping into my mind is in many ways as leaders, as achievers, as entrepreneurs, as the like no fail plan people, many times like we treat ourselves in this utilitarian fashion that our sense of self identity, self worth is derived purely from the title, sometimes the income, sometimes the output, sometimes it's the, the results that are generated. And without that feedback, right, perceived feedback, we don't know who the hell we are. And therefore, right, 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 right. So as you're talking and you're like, okay, but asking that loaded question of like, well, where does all that stuff come from? And it's like, okay, well, that comes from me. Well, if that comes from me, who are you? Like, who mm. are you really? And if we don't know who we are or even love or even like ourselves, it's going to be really, really hard to desire to look outside of our productivity being our basis of identity, mm -hmm. worthiness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the knife is good because it's sharp and cuts stuff. Right. And so seeing ourselves as knives of like <laughs> that utilitarian mindset, of, well, how much stuff can I cut through? Like how much can I smash through? And that's what makes me worthy is my use value rather than an intrinsic sense of worth or um, even, even if you can't believe in your own self-worth, how about believing in the worth of life of, of uh, your, your cellulature, like being a part of nature. Um, the, there's, there's this thing that happens also, um, Bailey, that, and this is dropping in for me, that being surrounded by so many machines and technology, um, we're, for the most part, uh, like we're of the generation raised with TVs, right, uh, radio, et cetera, or kids now are being raised with phones and, and screens and things like that. We've, we've had an increasingly um, mechanized relationship with focus of like, okay, so the TV is important, right, or the phone is important. These devices are important and they break down and when they break down you got to get them fixed and so the important the most important thing that the what gathers my family together the tv or the thing that gather brings my mother's attention to me this ipad or whatever this thing has broken down and it needs to get fixed so the more that we keep getting exposed to this mechanical paradigm of okay significance placed on you know bits of devices and technology and then how they break down and need to be fixed and break down and need to be fixed. They're, they're determined by their features and their use value. Spend enough time and by osmosis, we start to see ourselves not unlike these same devices of like, okay, in order for me to have a sense of significance in my family, I have got to entertain them like a TV or I have to look 
perfect, like so and so looks on Instagram, or I in and I have to go and go and go until I break down and then shove something in me so that I can be quote unquote fixed and back on my way. There's no processing or integration. It's just oh, um, this system. My system was down. And I, you know, kind of ghosted everyone and disappeared. And now I'm back and everything's fine. Everything is always fine, 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 fine. It's a strange kind of blending uh, and reinterpretation of ourselves, according to all the six, I would postulate, it was my, just a theory. Um, and I wrote about it in my book that all of this exposure to machines is causing us to less and less understand what it is to be human and instead base our worth off of just what you said right there, Bailey. It's our use value. Right, based on that output. Like in my mind, like even what you're talking about, and I think you did such a beautiful job in, in, in saying, like if the television is what brings my family together, and so therefore, you know, how can I be like the thing that brings my family together, which is the output, right? Always being entertaining or being on rather than playing into the full emotional range as a person but i think that that and maybe we're going we're going way deep here but i think because <laughs> we've never been accused of that oh please <laughs> standard <laughs> right, right. standard standard around here but like i think that we've forgotten how to teach each other humanity mm. in some ways like to play all the keys on the piano of our emotional range and instead it's like we treat ourselves as if we're supposed to have an on switch and off switch. And this channel's happy. This channel's mad. This channel's glad. This channel's sad. Right? This, is, this is what we're doing. Happy, mad, sad, glad. And do we evolve much from that? Mm. And then where do we turn to for comfort? Well, unfortunately, in many ways, like instead of turning to each other for comfort, because that would be what we would have to be taught, Instead, we are turning to our technology or our output. Right? I mean, I can definitely say there's been times in my life when my emotional uh, state has gotten to such a point that I've just thrown myself into my work because that's the place that I felt most like in control and in charge. And uh, the emotional space, whether it was relationship or like family or life, just felt so out of control that I went to what I could control. And that was finding my sense of self from my output in, in the work. And that only works so long, to your point, till the system breaks down. And then our whole focus is on got to fix it, got to fix it, got to fix it, rather than like, what am I learning? What mm. are the lessons? What are mm -hmm. these parts of me that are going to be born from the fact that this old way of doing it doesn't work anymore? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a crunchy state to be in, always doing, always going, um, and forgetting the learning and focusing on the outputs, um, as you would say, Bailey. And with that, you know, the great thing about meditation and the many philosophies that surround meditation as a practice and exercise is something altogether different, an altogether different focus from execution, output, right, getting things done. So instead, we're going into observation, observation and sensuality. So whenever people study meditation with me, they're like, okay, Victoria, you got to fix me. I can't turn my mind off. And I'm like, Everything with that sentence is all kinds of not, no, okay, <laughs> everything about that. So there's nothing wrong with you, number one, like, I am not your mechanic, child, I'm not going to open you up and slap something in and slap you back on the road, that's just not how it works here, um, so there's that. Um, so, okay, so you got to fix me. Oh, no, there's nothing wrong with you. you act, there's everything right with you. I can't turn my mind off, right? Okay, 
just like powering down the cell phone or turning off the TV. So it's a do, no, 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 turn, turn your mind off. That's apparently what a successful meditation is, according to most people. Uh, and actually, the way that I teach it is that meditation is just exposing yourself to a state of being relaxed and focused rather than being tight and focused. Because that tightness, that controlling, like you said, um, that tightness creates all kinds of secondary issues in the body and in the mind and in your personality. So being able to have exposure to being in a state of being relaxed, focused, that's all. And how you do that is through sensuality. What do I mean? I don't mean like, da na 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 na. I don't mean that. <laughs> Although that's a great meditation practice. Hey, um, but let's widen your perceptual field and like, you know, diversify your portfolio for sensuality here with the five senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. These connect you back to your humanity. Uh, for that meditative sit, I'm going to do a deep breath focusing on my sight, that sight organ. A deep breath focusing on sound, listening, just listening and relaxing actively as I listen. I'm going to do a deep breath around fragrance and inhaling, allowing the sense of smell to speak to me. I'm going to do a deep breath around sensation, touch, right? Okay, what, does, what is the texture of this um, cardigan that I'm wearing, for example? Sight, sound, taste, touch, and then smell. All of these, right? Doing a deep breath around all five of your senses connects you to one being focused, but also as you deep breathe, you are relaxed. Pairing the two together is the key to really taking your productivity as a human being, not as a glorified cell phone, right? Taking your productivity to a whole nother level, optimizing the system that you really are working with using sensuality. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, I have had the absolute pleasure of having Sensei Victoria in my life for, oh gosh, girlfriend, has it been like six, seven years? It's been a while. A long time, goddess, yeah. and even before yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, and a multitude of capacities. I mean, we have been in business mastermind groups for six or seven years together um, and being able to explore your you know, strategy brain, that space too. Uh, but one of the biggest gifts that I recall, and I mean, oh gosh, everyone, like I've been on retreats with Sensei Victoria. Her book's fantastic. Like her meditation's amazing. She's actually been an uh, unbelievable, still talked about to this day, um, expert at one of our, our retreats where she led us in like two, almost three hour uh, journey uh, right at the shoreline uh, where the Caribbean meets the Atlantic. I mean, like she's been in my life in so many different ways. And one of the biggest impacts that, that you've made, and I don't know if I've told you this, is when you talked about that space of sensuality. And I, of course I was like, all right, well, that means I got to get sexy up in this piece, but it wasn't about that, right? <laughs> it wasn't about that. It was about the five senses, right? And because I think I was so on my like full steam ahead that I wasn't thinking, oh, sensuality means senses. It means sexy, right? Well, what I've been fed on TV, whole different conversation, but smelling the coffee. So I drink coffee, I make it every morning. And she said, it was such a simple thing to say. And she said, I want you to smell the coffee as you're making it. And I'm thinking, oh, like, wait, when, well, when it's brewing, I got to pay attention. I got to like, am I like wiggly Jack Russell Terrier body is like trying to pay, okay, I got to pay attention to the coffee. It wasn't even that. It was, I take the coffee out of the cabinet. I open it up. I take a deep breath in. I smell that coffee. And it grounds me almost instantaneously into being present and enjoying and being in pleasure because that's the second most important thing that she's ever told me is what matters most is how you feel, right? Right. What matters most is how you feel. And that, mm -hmm. that breath, that grounding brings me right to where I am. And rather than my constant running to-do list, which we all have. So whether it is the smelling of the coffee or it is like just the touching of the texture of the clothes, whatever brings you 
into your senses. Like it's, everyone thinks you have to shut your brain off and meditate for an hour or 20 minutes or standing on your head or blah, 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 blah. Like can't even think about what you're going to have for dinner. But like, can you breathe and be a human being? Like let's get to our senses. Amen. Like, hello. This is so powerful because you can tell the difference as a follower or a team member in the room once the person who's leading is ungrounded versus grounded. When you have a leader at who you know is safe in their own body right? Who knows how to breathe deeply to come, become present and mindful and all of, okay, these are a lot of buzzwords, right? Mindfulness, presence, and all that types of stuff. I, and I want to make this as extremely concrete and precise as possible. It's about that sensuality, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. Like as Bailey said, smell the coffee, right? The more that you come into sensuality, the more that you begin to create this inner state of down regulation for yourself. And when you do, especially be that being a person in a leadership position, it widens your field. You're able to perceive more of all of the resources that are around you. Okay, I'm picking up on um, what so-and-so is feeling over here, or um, this person changed their perfume. Oh, that's interesting. Wonder what's going on with that. It's like a deeper level of communication that you're capable of rooting into with others by rooting into it yourself. That is why what matters most is how you feel. This is not to say that ev the best leaders are freaking selfish. Um, I would say instead the best leaders are self-aware, right? And encourage others to be self-aware as well, not only through um, giving permission, but by being permission. The, when you get into your body belly and you model that and even hearing that shift in your voice as you were relaying the story right there, that's positively contagious for someone listening in that brings them into the experience of, ah, I can enjoy this process. Okay. This powerhouse woman, Bailey freaking Fruman, sniffs her coffee? Like, what the heck? It suddenly becomes more significant to the person who's listening in because you yourself right now, goddess, are in a leadership position being, you know, the head and hostess of this podcast. And so for us as leaders, when we model that, we model humanity and model awareness, we model being powerful, being connected, and deep natural communication. Right, right, right. And I think that that widening, that opening, that awareness, more than anything, actually increases our capacity. Right? It's the difference between quantity, how much you can churn out, right? Which that shit, that mindset came from the industrial age, right? Totally. And that's old stuff that's just like hanging around of how much you can churn out. Mm -hmm. Quantity and quality. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we only have so many years and none of us know when our expiration date is, more or less. But like, What's the quality of the life that you're living? And if you're finding that you're not fulfilled or you're not satisfied, like how do you make changes? And I think that is by getting connected to yourself. Because mm. otherwise you'll stay on that hamster wheel. We all will. Because as much as we could be bitching about having a, a, a rock in our shoe, we'll keep going along if that's all we believe that we're capable of. Mm -hmm. So as silly as it sounds, yes, smelling the coffee, like really taking a big deep breath of the coffee or just opening up the window and taking a beautiful deep breath, you know, getting ourselves well-resourced and well-supported. We model humanity and guess what? It's a trickle down effect so that we're all enjoying quality of life, mm -hmm. our capacity to go deep and enjoying this one life that we do have. Mm -hmm. beautifully said and what dropped in as you were saying that um, my spirit guide sent me a vision of 
Henry Ford and the Model T, right? That original car, you know, that everyone was driving back, um, back in the day. And okay, if we just focused on making more of those, if we just focused on making more Model Ts, quantity, quantity, we would still have the same old car with the same crunchy suspension that could literally you bite your tongue off while you're driving the freaking car, right? You would still have that, all of that um, smog and pollution that it was generating. But innovation, right, creativity and innovation comes from sensuality. When you're able to widen your perceptual field enough, riding in one of those Model Ts to be like, you know what, this, like, I wish this could be smoother, right? I'm feeling like I'm being rocked around here. You know, I don't really, oh, I can't breathe when all that um, exhaust comes out. You know, I wonder if there's a way to make this better. I wonder if there's a way to make this better. Innovative leaders are centrally connected. That kind of a visionary question that creates innovation and expansion that completely blows all competition out of the water, right, makes it irrelevant, comes from sensuality. If you can't widen that perceptual field and really see all of the potentials, the opportunities that are in your environment by being sensual, then you're basically just repeating the same old thing and expecting to get different results. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in that space of grounding, um, in that space of connecting to our senses, in that space of connecting to our capacity, um, our sense of self, our sense of, of identity outside of output, you know, and in showing up in humanity, what I hear you saying is like, that's where the real magic happens, yes. right? Like yeah. that's where the creativity comes from. That's where the expansion comes from. That's also where like the ahas come from of, uh, of growing beyond, again, being a robot in your life, being just the executor of your to-do list where each of us are so much more than what we can just put out. And at the end of the day, what are we modeling for the people around us? Whether it's our kids or our team, like what are we modeling? And from what we're modeling, like how do we all benefit from it? Mm -hmm. You know, they say that everything that you want is just outside of your comfort zone. And you know, there's more than just pain and effort as a vehicle for going outside of your comfort zone. There's also pleasure, sensuality, innovation, creativity, <gasps> inspiration, right? All of that. There's so much more bliss-based and pleasure-based ways to move outside of your comfort zone rather than grinding and smashing your way out of it or like driving yourself into the ground. And so if you're open to it, and I love how in an earlier podcast episode, Bailey, you were talking about surrender and vulnerability, right? If you're open to it, allowing yourself to drop in, allowing yourself to surrender to the moment, right? Or to soften and allow that sensuality to come in, inspiration then has enough room to just drop in. You know, inspiration means in spirit, right, is the insertion of spirit, new life, new innovation, new ideas, new energy. And so if you can surrender and just allow yourself to fall a little bit more open with, again, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, it's not rocket science, not rocket science at all. The more you're open to those innovations coming through. Right, right, right. Which you know, for me, it leads me to, to my next question and point I want us to, to kind of dive into a little bit um, is so often people ask themselves and others around them, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And do you find that through meditation or that sense of, of connection to our senses that we're able to tap into our intuition more. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit, Victoria, like tapping into our intuition, which is kind of the playbook on what to do. But we're so like trying to find out what to do from external sources 
that we don't always realize that we kind of have the roadmap written within. But when we've got too much static on the radio from all of our like head shit, because we've all got it, that it's really, really hard to access what's been there all along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I talking about that a little bit? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So indecision is always a calibration issue. Indecision is always a calibration issue. Something is misaligned within the person, right? That they are picking up on more of the static, right? Such as what, uh, what you said, Bailey, than their right aligned direction and right aligned next step. And so the power of meditation is that the more that you come into that relaxed, focused state, the more that you ground in to your senses, right? And what happens is that your calibration on its own, just naturally, resets. Now, what do I mean by calibration? I want um, you to think, everyone listening or watching, I want you to think of your ability to make decisions of like a compass that you have. And so if your compass, you've, you've got it out and you have a map, let's say you have the playbook of how to become a millionaire or you know, to seven steps to a breakthrough or how to get a man or what, whatever, you have the map, great. And the map says north, south, east, west. But all right, if, if those of you who are from ancient history remember that in order to navigate a map, you have to have a compass, it's okay, right? You have your compass, but it keeps spinning round and around and around and around and around. This is a calibration issue. Are you going to get where, you're, where you wanna go? Absolutely not, because you have no idea which, which way is true north. Which way is true north? Whereas when we meditate, what happens is that naturally true north for every single person opens up. Maybe the process of true north opening up for you, right? You going through your calibration process. I've seen this many times. It's like maybe it starts to leak out of your eyes as you first start meditating. Okay, that's fine. You're calibrating. Maybe for another person, you get really uncomfortable being in the meditation and in the sit. Like the, the disquiet is uncomfortable. Great, great you are apparently finding south, <laughs> right? So if you found south, you're gonna find where north is. So the allowing that calibration, then you can finally use the compass to navigate all of the different blueprints that you have inherited from others or even devised and divine for yourself. So if, if someone like is experiencing that confusion, indecision, insecurity of what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Victoria, just tell me, what do I do? Right? This, it would be remiss of me to just flat out say, do this. Because everyone has that compass built in, right? That is basically taking your power away from you. If I'm to tell you, well, do this, then that immediately you're off the hook right? You're off the hook. I'm on a pedestal and I have all of your power. You just handed it to me. Thanks. But I'm of a mind personally, I'm a hot potato that back to you. I don't, ugh, I don't, I don't want it. I don't, that was meant for you. That power that you have to make your own decisions, that is, uh, I sincerely believe, a birthright. Like that is something that belongs in your hands and is best placed there. I know the biggest disappointments um, and worst hurts I've ever had in my life were when I gave all my power away and assumed the other person could handle it. Um, and at the same time, that was also my own decision. So even as we give our power away, that's, that is also right, an, a decision that you're making. So when you ask somebody, if it comes down to it, if someone's asking like, well, Victoria, what do I do? Or I'm having a hard time figuring out what's the next step for us as a team, right, et cetera. Then you got, uh, your number one focus has to be getting back to center, back to grounding. Focus on your recalibration. How you do that is through, again, meditation practice, connecting to sensuality. And it's a mysterious process, right? I would love to tell you that, oh, you sit for five minutes and then bam, you're going to get it, 
right? Um, that linear mindset or you know, masculine mode that we all have, whether you are male or female or trans, doesn't matter. We all have a masculine mode that is linear and expecting I, I invest, I get my ROI. This instead is, a, is an experience and a revelation process, not unlike witnessing your potential blossoming. The more that you expose yourself to being relaxed and focused, the more your calibration will blossom open over time. But the amount of time is irrelevant, right? It's, it's entirely irrelevant. It's different for other people. But the more that you expose yourself to it, the more it gives your intuition the ability to lead. And so that you can listen to those downloads, trust your gut, follow the signs, right? See the signs and follow them. Um, the resonance allowing that to help you feel that magnetism in your compass to true north. I love it. So like it's, this is such an important conversation because we do, we detach from ourselves and we expect that everybody else has the answers but ourselves. And here's the thing, like the only person who really has the answers is you. I mean, I've known plenty of times when I've tried to outsource my inner knowing, um, assuming that you know helpers or gurus or support in some way had it more figured out than I do. But it's not a matter of that they have the answer. No, they can help you with the tools to find the answer. So even as you're talking about this now, and, and anyone who wants to read a little bit deeper on this, you, you can check out um, uh, Sensei Victoria's book, Natural Intuition. Um, amazing, great book, quick read, but like one that was just, to me, made it all make sense and made it more of a priority. Um, because meditation is kind of like flossing in the sense of, <laughs> if you floss, you're going to get great results, but it's also really easy not to floss. And instead, like, making meditation more of a priority because I found that it was less about it being transactional of me getting an immediate result, but instead the, the commitment to the journey. Like you might not see right now what's happening in between your teeth, but let me just tell you, uh, you ignore that stuff for a couple of years and you're going to end up with uh, dentures. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's true. It's true. So uh, Sensei Victoria, before we wrap up, you know, I know that um, they can check out your book, Natural Intuition, um, and that you also have an amazing podcast yourself, yeah. Journeypreneur. Uh -huh. uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the, your podcast so people can listen in on more conversations like this, as well as I know that you have a gift for us today. So give yeah. us a scoop there, girl. Yeah. Oh my goddess. Absolutely. And so thank you for that. Um, my book you can find on Amazon is Natural Intuition Now. You type that in with Sensei Victoria Whitfield. It'll come right up. It's like got like a picture of grass on it. Really great read. Um, and let's see my podcast, the Journeypreneur podcast on iTunes. Bailey has been on. It's one of many amazing distinguished guests uh, that I've had the honor of interviewing, sharing her story, right? Um, your podcast episode with me was not just one aha moment, right? It's a series of them. It was really great to have that conversation with you. So you can check that out, everyone, um, hopping over there. And for your free gift, um, I would love for you to get to see your alignment. I have an assessment on my website, victoriawhitfield.com forward slash quiz, so that you can self-assess what is the one thing that is keeping you out of alignment in your business with the flow of abundance. You head there and it'll send you your results. Um, so it's personalized to each person and I'm excited to see what your results are. Yeah. And, and you're right. Like, we're not a one size fits all. We're like, like you said before, okay, five minutes, ding, you you know, meditation done, you're cooked. So this is not a hot pocket here, like, right? But instead, like we all have our recipe that makes up who we are and to have better insight because that's what helpers, gurus, experts, I mean, Victoria has been such a valuable, like secret weapon in my life for sure. Um, is like to have those tools in hand and have that added insight. It makes such a difference. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging with us today. All of our goodies and resources are going to be in the show notes um, from today's episode. 
And uh, yeah, always such a, a great treat to jam with you. And I definitely, it's funny because even as we're talking, I was like, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. I was like, okay, we're going to be here for about four or five hours, maybe six. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll definitely jam on future episodes for sure. But thank you yeah. so much for joining us today. Absolutely. We're going to have to have you back on mine too. I was like, oh, this is such a great conversation. Yeah. <laughs> well that's and isn't that the truth it's like the whole goal is to be in flow and have those conversations that elevate because at the end of the day a rising tide lifts all ships mm -hmm. thank you my friend yeah big love